The illustrious Jabba bids you welcome. <laughs> I'm going to regret this. I'm Pete Mitchell. He's Peyton Jones. And this is the Church Planner Podcast. Brought to you by Church Planner Magazine. Hey, welcome to Church Planner Magazine Podcast. <laughs> <Get over. laughs> no, not doing it over. Not doing it over. Not do it over. Nope. All right. Okay, here we go. That's good because I was about to do something really obscene in the microphone just because I uh, thought we'd do it over. What? Like obscene for you is like, I'm going to go do a doo-doo. <laughs> it, well, it was, it was the messenger of the doo-doo. You know, it was... Hey, see, I might as well have just done it. <laughs> but that would have immortalized my gas on this podcast forever. Welcome to the Church Planner Podcast, everybody. If you're new here, uh, you're probably in the wrong place, and you've probably figured that out by now. I'm Peyton Jones. Uh, do we have a guest today? No, you. Oh, I me. Mean, I'm your guest. Well, because you guest. said you wanted to interview your wife at one point. I did. You know what? That would have been rad if I had remembered that. But uh, she is coming in a little later. If she gets here by the end of Smack Talk, Jeez. then guess what? That's how professional this podcast is. Uh, hey, if we much the wheels came off in our first year. <laughs> <laughs> well, as he said, he's Peyton Jones, and I'm Pete Mitchell, and you're listening to the Church Planner Podcast. So, no joke, man. I had more moments of fame this week. I had a guy in uh, Colorado actually drive out to where I was at in Denver opening a church planning training center on behalf of North American Mission Board and the gentleman drove to come see me because his friend said hey Peyton Jones is there and he came up and said I'd always wanted to meet you then there was another guy named <laughs> Joey who was he actually clearly, part of the training he clearly doesn't listen to the podcast he wasn't that impressed when I've always him. wanted to meet you that's just called pleasantries I could tell when when he came you know kind of within like two feet of me it was kind of like that william wallace moment where he goes i and he shoots fire out of his and he then thunderbolts come you, from his eyes you could actually say that word in america it's in the uk you can't say that word yeah you can say arse here but not there yeah was that wrong see i feel dirty now and that's what, oh, it's only because i brought forth if you're in britain right now and you heard me say the word arse that's like the american polite way of saying it when we're joking around, kind of making fun of you guys, but um, which is funny because it, it really isn't us making fun of them. Because let's be honest, oh, yes, no one is. in America even thinks about them for like any That's time at all. That's kind of true. When we do think of you, we kind of make fun of you, British people. When, and when we think this of, is with when we with think of the UK, when we think of the UK, we just think they really should just say thank you to us for saving them, or they'd all be speaking German right now. Let's just but let's just you see, put it out the there. The thing is, is there's that that superiority, superiority. See, because we can't talk proper. Of course, they think this. They invented the English language, and we screwed it up. But then on top of that, I bumped into an English. We improved guy it. Hey, I bumped into an English guy this morning, and I don't hate the English. I, we we tease and we're ribbing you, and if you were. Really offended by this? Stop being so English about it. I'm just saying, right? <laughs> if you were a Celt, a Scot, an a, a, an Irish person, a, a Welshman, you the reality think it was is funny. There's there's only like like five people in all of the UK who listen to the podcast. So so you check know. this out. This is this is why the Celts get mad at the English. And I know I'm just totally offending English people, but you need to hear it from an American. Because let's be honest, whenever a British person says anything about America, and this is not a nationalistic moment for me. I usually agree with them, but normally they're taking the mick. They're making fun of us. That's just true. And don't act so innocent, British person, particularly the English. You know, I'm looking at you because you excel in subtlety, right? So, you know, you know, you're saying it without saying it. But here's the deal. This morning, I bump into this guy. I, I know a buddy named Louis DeMeo. Guy planted like 21 churches in France, right? Came over here oh, about yeah. 10 years ago. Yeah. You and I met him. Yep. We I bump into him this morning because he lives not too far from me. Anytime I see that guy, he's with a pack of dudes. And this morning, he was at Revolution Roasters, my favorite coffee shop in the San Diego area. And he was there doing a discipleship group. Now, I think Louie has a discipleship group in every 
single coffee shop in San Diego, right? At least North County. He's amazing. It's all he does all day is start discipleship groups. They become churches. It's many he's got a burden for. And when I saw him this morning, he had this English guy. The English guy wouldn't save yet. But we got into it a little bit because I asked him at one point, I said, oh, where are you from? And he goes, oh, oh, you know, and you could tell. I was like, OK, here we go. He said he was from the southeast. Now, that's that's part of the issue there. He said, I'm from the southeast, you know, London. He was talking to me like I was super ignorant. And I said, oh, well, I lived in Wales for a while. He said, oh, yes. Well, I said, well, what part of London? He goes, you know, now I decline because, you know, that is such an American thing to ask. And I looked at him and said, well, I am American. And that's such a very English thing of you to say and take <laughs> issue with. That's what the Welsh would say about you. Stop being so English about it. <laughs> what did and he say? He didn't know what to say. Because in, in England, you, you, you're you clever and you're subtle and you, you, you have a little bit of wordplay. And when an American comes in and says, hey, cut the crap, knock it off, right? Like, you just call them out on it. It's It's like you take the weapons out of their hand. You know what I'm saying? You stick the sword and the shield out of the hand and said, all right, let's fight. Come on. You bring it. And uh, it was kind of fun. I'm just saying maybe that was my sin nature, but uh, we turned it around really quick. I'm just saying. You almost said that was a little John Wayne draw. Listen up here, Pilgrim. <laughs> it's not going to go down like you English. So I do have I something think. to share. You know how I've been fond of playing some of the voicemails I get from people? <laughs> someone played me uh, another uh, – someone played me a message. Kirk Overstreet. Yeah, Did Kirk you Overstreet. That? Yeah. Oh, my gosh. Are yeah. you playing it? Not Kirk's. I got another one. You ready for this one? Mm. I don't think this is Nana. Okay, that was either Chinese Nana. Or it's not done. She, she's going for it. I'm kind of wondering. She's still going. Do you think that's a robocall? I can't tell. Dude, you just got chewed out in Chinese. She's mad. Did All you I know text is that angst in her I voice? really want someone to interpret that for me and tell right. me what it said. All right. I know we interrupted it, but if you're out there, audience, and you can translate that, please do. And I don't want to be offensive and like ask certain people who I know are – uh, how do I put this? Not white. They they they're Asian because I'm afraid I'm going to be asking like a Korean on a on a Chinese thing, and I that can't. That was Chinese. I don't know. That was clearly how Chinese. Do you know? How can you tell the difference? I just can. Well, there's two languages in China. Which one? Mandarin, Cantonese. Ooh, you got me. Cantonese. I, I don't. I don't. I don't know all the languages. I, my my extent of Mandarin and uh, Cantonese <laughs> pretty much Mandarin. goes to the selection of the food that I eat. Mm, Kung Pao chicken. <laughs> see, now, they, you, you are a vent. See, they, here you're trying so hard, and then you just blow it. You're being so mm, careful. Orange chicken. <laughs> I I feel I feel like when Merlin in uh, in Excalibur looks at Uther and goes, "Years I have built." In moments you have broken. <laughs> I I can't relate. Sorry. Yeah. No, it's cool. It's cool. It's a great movie. Yeah. So, I, you know, in the last week, I'm trying to think if I did anything really cool. I got something really you cool coming up. because I was gone and you lost your mojo when I left the state. That that pretty much is a guarantee. I'm going to lose my mojo. Um, hey, lost his mojo. I am doing the herbal ri Urban Rifle this Saturday. That's going to be lots of fun. Is that like where you go through other people's things in the inner city? So like I, an urban I, would, I don't know. Through. I'm going to find out. Uh, you know, I'm Urban gonna... rifle. Is that like I'm going to shoot people in the city? Is that kind of like a new blood sport? Pretty much because it's all Ted based Nugent on. Nugent would be way behind that. It's all based on uh, essentially using your rifle in closer combat. So Ted Nugent had a show years ago, Pete, and it was – he was in his helicopter. Now, I was in Wales when I saw it, and I think I saw it on MTV. Um, yes, I was only watching MTV for research purposes, if any pastors are listening. I'm salty today. 
I don't. I I live in a trailer. If man. any I'm pastors salty. are listening, the whole podcast is designed <laughs> for pastors. Church planners would go, dude, MTV, yeah, and and you know, uh, pastors would say Beavis and his unmentionable friend. You would actually watch that. Yeah, who said that? Who actually said his unmentioned? That was John MacArthur, known for saying a lot of great things, I might add. Um, <laughs> like that we should not be social, it, it, social issues oh. should not even be a concern of ours. But, oh. uh, but it, anyways, um, I, uh, Ted Newton, there was a commercial for him, and maybe you saw this show, and I've never seen it. I always thought it would be the coolest thing, but I don't know how they did it for insurance. He was in a helicopter. He had a rifle that had a net, and he was hunting people on his ranch. And it was like a game show. I kinda, He's in a helicopter. I kind of remember this. I, I was thinking, I did. I never saw it. But like that goes through my head sometimes. I think, that has to have been the best show ever invented, where you're hunting people, kind of like The Running Man. Remember that movie with oh, Arnold? One of the best. One why, of the greats. Why could we not have a game show like The Running? Forget all this, like, what's the one, The Greatest Race? Forget that. It's like The Greatest Hunt. Why don't we do that? There have been on, so me. many movies made off of that concept. So well, many. You need movies. a game show. Forget American Ninja. It's like American Ninja, but I'm going to chase I was, you. I was actually reading an article uh, yesterday that basically says that by the end of Trump's first term, so in the next two years, we're going to have a depression. We get to hunt Trump? Worse than the first Great Depression. Great. Looking and forward to that. I know. I will. And they were basically pointing to all the debt, like all the debt that the nation has, student loans, housing loans, credit cards, everything, the debt. And they go, basically, they're either going to have to literally default on the debt as a nation or we're going to have runaway inflation, like 1,000% wow. inflation. And all I could think of wow. was, all right. It's almost Mad Max Thunderdome. I'm getting some more guns. Yeah. I'm getting some more ammo. Enter. One man leave. Do men enter. One man leave. Because <laughs> it's going down, baby. Okay, young people, listen to me. If you have not ever seen Mad Max Beyond Thunderdome, oh. put the podcast down right now. Pick it up. You don't even have to watch one and two. You really don't. Let me give you a 10-second background. There's a dude named Mad Max. He's an ex-cop bunch of like post-nuclear war thugs killed his family and he's out for vengeance to kill everybody now part three cue music begin (laughs) (laughs) that's so rad right on cue blasta blasta you have to watch beyond thunderdome and don't worry about when it shifts halfway through and it's about the kids it's about the kids man It's 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 a movie for kids (laughs) <laughs> well, towards the, you know, I remember as a kid watching Mad Max Beyond Thunderdome. Second half, I'm like, what? wait, what happened to all the killing and the shooting and the fighting and the, this is kids now, like, he's saving kids, like, and as I've gotten older now, I, I get it. It's like, yeah, you got to, you know, do something bigger than just vengeance. He kind of finds a greater cause and he can't raise his family, but he can help get these guys. It's cool. You know, when, when you get older, you understand these things. <laughs> oh man. I, I, can't. I still want to more killing and smash him with giant hammers. The giant hammer that well, master blaster has all oh. the giant. Yeah. But you know what? I still can't believe how big of a fan you were. A fury road. Love that movie. Yeah. Oh you were God. like a huge fan. Oh, Oh, loved Road. it, dude. Thought it was a masterpiece. Yeah. You know I got that in 3D. Oh, when do we want? Didn't we watch that already in 3D? I don't know. Because I saw it in the me. theater in 3D. I don't, I don't know. We, you know you know what movie I saw last that. weekend that you would hate? What? <laughs> uh, the Predator. You know, it's funny you say that because I almost went and saw it, but Andre wants to see it. Because, uh, you know, I've never... Okay. I'll take your wife. You're, you're going to hate me. Because <laughs> it was good. Any I, respect you had for me. I enjoyed it so much. I'm like, yeah, Dude, it's Predator. I've never seen the original. That's kind of amazing, actually. I know. Right? I mean, and the original I, was phenomenal. And, and I never saw Commando. I've got I it. I saw the beginning of Commando, the first, like, half hour, and that's it. I've got it in 3D. The first Predator. They Dude, remastered it in 3D. It? Do I need to come down and give you some cuddles? No, and- because you'll probably get in trouble. That's all I'm going to say. 
So no, absolutely I'm supposed not. to be working. Yes. <laughs> I, well, we all know that. Uh, never mind. I'm just not even going to go there. So, uh, there. how are things? <laughs> things are good. I still live in a trailer, and oh, I just yeah. back. I saw you guys road. digging a ditch. Yeah. You know, I dug a giant ditch. Um, it's pretty dang big. I think it's like 70 foot long, two foot wide. I have two five foot square. I drove the Bobcat. I got to tell you, closest thing you will ever feel to being like Ripley in the exoskeleton suit is hopping in one of those. They're easy to operate. How can you I did not see the Predator that. after that? Uh, after I mean, you, just, I you dropped a Ripley comment. And you've it, never seen the Predator. It's just no one ever wanted to like watch it with me. I think I've seen the end where he blows him up. You know, he takes his little deal and yeah, he, he blows puts himself it on him up. And hits it right. He blows himself. I've seen up. the end because I had remember like back when you had HBO and Showtime, and movies were just you never caught the whole movie. I'm the son of a Baptist pastor. Do you think we had HBO? But didn't you set it up at Biola? Like first thing, you set up cable as soon as you got to Biola. I lived in the dorms. <laughs> <laughs> so, in the old do, days, do you want to hear about my TV? In the days of your, I, I have to tell you this, man. Yeah. My best friend Reggie Kyles, he and I were roommates. He had a TV. He all of a sudden couldn't afford to stay in the dorms, so he moved out. And at first, the agreement was he was going to leave the TV, and then he decided not to. Now, kids, I want you to think back. To those old TVs you remember from yesteryear, that's yeah. what this thing was. It had the dial, right? Yeah. That you had to turn. Doom, 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 doom. That if you was did it real broke. Fast, it was like a machine gun. The dial was broke. So what we did to turn the TV, I had taken a fork from the cafeteria and bent one of the prongs down so we could Whoa. shove it in the dial hole and no turn way and change the channel. Oh my gosh, that's genius. So imagine how upset I was. Pliers. Imagine how upset I was when he takes that TV to his house. I invented the fork that turned the channel. Dude. What's up? That TV should be immortalized. You would totally own copyright on that technology. I really should. Really, really Dang, should. Dang, dude. That's cool. I didn't know you are that, like, clever. You're when like it comes to watching TV, I'm going to figure out a way. <laughs> dude, we're, we're going to call you McPeter from now on. Yeah. Um, part of the reason why my parents uh, felt like they wasted money on my college education yeah, because <laughs> you're like, hey, I learned things. It was like going to trade school, man. You should have seen me. I tried to tell them I did not want to go to college. I tried to explain this to them. <laughs> it's not my fault that I told them I'm not made for college, and they wasted money. I, that was their choice. So guess what I did this morning? What did you do this morning? I went to the gym. Oh, yeah? What's his, what's his last name? 10 years. Jim who? It, there's actually people in there, Pete. Jim Brubaker? No, I went to the gym, like the gymnasium. There was no monkeys, no swinging around, no monkey bars. There was like a bunch of people running in place, and there was a bunch of sweaty dudes looking at themselves in the mirrors and holding things. That was that was kind of what it was. Nice. I haven't been there in so long. I went there with my wife, and uh, I had my, like, this is how unprepared I am for working out. I had my weightlifting gloves from like 20 years ago. And I had a Trader Joe's bag with like a change of clothes. Like I am just so not cool. Then I had my trench digging shoes on, which were kind of dirty. And uh, yeah, I had shorts that were like workout shorts, but nothing else, man. I was so unprepared. I was so uncool in the gym, and I kind of like that. Well, I'm very happy for you. Uh, so when's the next time you're going back? Wednesday. Because it's not so much that you went; it's that repeat. A business. Oh, it was huge that I went at all. It was like breaking through the barrier. Like, I haven't been here in like 10 years. Yeah. But, you know, not being prepared, I kind of felt like Rocky, like in Rocky Four, where he doesn't have all the kit that Ivan Drago has, but he's got like a wheelbarrow full of rocks, you know? What's that song that well, they sing at the end? That's how you know steroids are bad, because Drago used steroids, and Rocky was all natural. <gasps> I remember the song. Hearts on fire, something <laughs> desire. Oh, man, that would have been rad if I'd had that on Dude, my playlist. Rocky and I'd be was, like, I am Rocky. You are all baby men. Rocky was pretty much just music video. Like, was, if you if you think montage. back. Even Rocky had a montage. They, they're music videos. That's really. Like, I'm you just, remember when Apollo Creed dies 
and he's out driving his Porsche. It's it's a music video. They've made the movies in the music video. Oh, it was rad. But do you want to know the real reason I went there? See if you can guess in three guesses. Well, if you were I single, I would say to pick chair. up chicks, but you're not single, so I have no idea. Nope, that's why I cruise the mall. And normally I look at my wife. I <laughs> you are you salty. Not. You are salty today. I, I you would never say that normally. I, I look at my wife all the time. I go, when we have to go to the mall, I go, hey, you want to go to the mall and cruise some chicks? <laughs> she always goes, okay. <laughs> she loves the mall. She's an 80s girl. Yeah, my wife loves the mall, too. I won't go. So, uh, okay, three guesses. Okay, so cruising chicks is not one. I have no idea. Not a clue. A warm shower. That's why I went to the gym. To use the warm shower. I actually had a buddy who was homeless living in his car, and he wouldn't give up his uh, his gym membership because yeah. he would go take a shower every day. So I broke my water main. Here I am digging with a bobcat in my, uh, in my yard the other day. Do I hit the water main? No, I carefully shovel around it. But my buddy goes through the irrigation pipe, and what do I do? I go to switch the water main valve off, which has been buried underground for about 20 years, and it snaps off, locking my water completely off. So when I get done, I'm covered in dirt. I can't even take the cold shower. One of the few vestiges of civilization I actually have right now. You know what? You live by the ocean. I don't, I, I don't exactly. in any way. You know what I had to do? Go, I had to, the go ocean. to the end of my street, go to the public shower that's on the bluff overlooking the ocean, and I'm standing there under this kind of lukewarm water. The sun's down. It's kind of night. There's these pretty clouds over the ocean. And I think to myself, yeah, I could be homeless. This ain't so bad. You can be homeless where you live quite easily and be like, <laughs> life is just good. not bad. It is pretty like, good. Like, I'm going to eat pizza out of the dumpster over at Pizza Port. You know, the Italian place here, gourmet Italian place, I might eat some of their food out of the dumpster. I, I mean, there's like, tons look, of Look, I'm going to find me a good millennial who's looking for a cause. I'm going to be their cause. They yeah, can provide man. me food. I'm going to live on the beach. It's gonna I'm going to hang around churches a bit. They'll know me as, like, old Bob. I'll go by Bob. I won't tell them my real identity. It'll be like church planning research. I'll just be undercover. Remember that time Eddie Murphy went undercover as a white person? No. Never saw that? No. Oh, my gosh, dude. Okay, you have to Google that when we're done today. Eddie, Eddie Murphy, Murphy a- does a whole documentary on Saturday Night Live. It's probably about I never seven watched minutes Saturday long. Night Live. I never, I never he puts cared himself, for that show. He gives himself a brown mustache and a brown wig. He paints his skin white, and he goes under, and he, he has to do, like, uh, a white voice. exercises where he tucks his butt in. So he walks, like, with his butt in, like, they, they tell him, like, pretend you have a stick anyways. So he does that, and he has to practice talking so he's believable. So he reads all these Hallmark cards. And he's like, I love you very much. I treasure your friendship. It's great. You have to watch it. I'm going to take he your word for it. goes to pay for things at the store, they're like, just take it, man. You, you don't have to give us money. What are you doing? It's great. That's funny. I like it. I do. Yeah, it's pretty cool. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. So, um, that. I, I got, I got yeah. nothing. I got nothing to share. You know, part of it is because you made me wait an hour. Like, I was ready I to do it. this at nine and be like, I'm on. So I do have one quick story I'm going to share with you. My, uh, my next door neighbor, who over the 11, 12 years that we've lived here, I've managed to talk to them maybe two or three times total. Um, the husband was turning 60 years old, and for the last week and a half, the wife was like, hey, uh, I'm just going to apologize now. We're having a, a 60th birthday party for my husband, and they're all thinking that you know they're 25 still, and uh, they've got a band, and so we're going to have live music. Um, and so literally the day before, she goes to all the neighbors and brings them a letter with, hey, you know, please don't call the police. Call me if there's a problem. If it's too loud, call me, right? And she, like, brings over a case of beer for me. She's like, oh, you drink IPA, don't you? Here, here's a case. <clears throat> they had two porta potties in their driveway. Like, they were just like, this is going to be the biggest band ever. Uh, by the way, your mic's off still. And so um, I... uh 
I was joking with Jamie and I go, you know what? I bet you anything. Cause we got this one neighbor behind us who like calls the cops on everybody for everything. And I go, right. Guaranteed cops are going to come. Uh, but I'm kind of curious as to how many ambulances are going to come tonight. <laughs> like that was, that was really? my joke. So it, honestly, it wasn't that bad. I mean, our house is pretty, pretty robust. Like we didn't hear much and our side of the house don't hear a thing. So we're in bed. It's about 1130 at night. And all of a sudden our dog who sleeps in our bedroom, she starts growling. And so that wakes me up. She goes, take Uh-oh. off. She goes, run it. So I like, I'm looking and I could tell through the blinds something was happening, but I didn't know what. <laughs> so I look out Somebody's the window. Being in your bush outside your window, aren't they? No. So I look out the window and sure enough, it's the cop lights. The cops are over there. And I'm like, I'm like inside. I'm laughing because I'm like, you guys are 60 years old thinking you're 25 and the cops got to come put down your party. And you there's cars all over the street. Like, you know, the cops are thinking teenagers. <laughs> and mm-hmm. No, they show up and there's a bunch of 60 year olds with porta potties in the driveway. Like, that's oh, how many people were at porta this potties. Thing. Who throws a party and rents porta potty? And nothing says I care for you, my guests, like a porta potty in the driveway. When you expect so many people that you got to put porta potties in your driveway, you are thinking Burning Man is happening at your house. Like that's what's wow. going on. Yeah, Burning Man. Yeah. So then, five minutes later, I'm I'm back in bed. Five minutes later, it's like there's a flood of light coming in through my blinds, and all I'm wow. thinking is. The SWAT team's here. Like, the SWAT wow. truck. So I get up, and I look at the window. Sure enough, it's an ambulance. Oh, no. Taking out the bed. I'm like, dude, you knew that was going to happen. Yeah. You yeah. And now I'm st- I still don't know. I'm dying to know. But, I, you know, I don't talk to these neighbors. I want to know what happened. Someone get drunk, fall over. What See, happened? Here's the thing. Like, you would love to be the cop who shows up. And sees the sixty-year-old answer the door and go, "Really? Aren't you a little old for this?" You know, they're like, like hey, "Hey, officer, what do what's going on? What's, we're okay over here. Oh, we'll turn down the music. It's all out. You know, they're doing stuff like that. <laughs> it's their sixtieth birthday party. Thinking they're twenty-five. I've never seen your impersonation of a of a sixty-year-old drunk person answering the door to the police. That's a new one." <laughs> Oh man, so that's your neighbor. So you're gonna go ask him? What I haven't happened? seen him. I, I, I haven't if seen you him. If you're that concerned, you can ask anything. Pete. I kid you not. This is this is what I did though. I went over there. I used the porta potty. You did not. I was wearing a robe and I took my newspaper. So when I'd see him in the morning, I was like exiting and I just kind of looked at them and then walked away. You're such a liar. No, it was great. You did great. not. Oh yeah, I totally did. You really went there, took totally the did. Porta potty in your bathrobe and used their bathroom. And I was waiting until I heard them out in the driveway, so that way I could like exit with like my newspaper and the robe on. And I'm like, oh no way! All I did was a head nod You're and then swap. You're such a liar. No, You're no, such a liar. Told true. It's a true story. <laughs> that would be very Pete Mitchell. <laughs> that would be pretty rad if you did do that. Oh, so. <laughs> Hey, how long is this going to be there? This thing's great. <laughs> well, I would figure you of all people would be like, "Oh, no, that's great. You should have a porta potty. Everyone should have a porta potty in their hey, lawn." Hey man, I have I have gotten good at using the porta potty. Is it still at your house the porta potty? No, I took it as soon as my contractor went upside down, I called that day. I'm like, "Get this thing out of here." What's so. funny is uh the porta potties that they had were really nice or really? are really nice. Yeah, not like those blue ones. These things are like yeah. insulated. With like, you know, they got a little heater in there. I mean, these things what? are, dude, sixty year olds. They know how to get a porta oh, potty. Yeah, yeah. They're like, uh, I wonder, I wonder, because mine's diamonds. They must have rented like platinum. I don't know. Yeah. The only cool porta potties I'd ever seen before are those blue ones. Like we yeah. got a company around here called First John. <laughs> <They do porta-potties. laughs> no. Yes. Obviously, a Christian porta potty. It's J O N. I mean, I don't know if that's a difference, but it's First John. John. That's funny. Yeah, the first John one was pretty funny. And then there was another one that was uh, a play on that. I'll see if I can remember it later. It can only go so far, that (laughs) joke. That would have been good, though. (laughs) After that, it's Revelation. (laughs) (laughs) You don't want to name your porta potty company Revelation. That's not good. Oh, no. (laughs) 
Oh my gosh. Oh, that's such the wrong name for a porta potty company. <laughs> oh my gosh. Uh, you know, and you're always, I use porta potties. I went to the Viking Festival in Vista yesterday, and man, I, I'm telling you, I, you, you don't want a revelation when you open that door, man. <laughs> I went, I went like past all these ones of red, 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 and I was like, oh no, they've locked them. It was right before the, the thing closed. And, uh, and then I got one open. I was a little scared when I opened it because, when when all of them are red and one's green, you're thinking, I bet somebody's in there, <laughs> but they didn't lock it. That's a terrible experience. When you walk in on someone and when they're in the bathroom, it's not good. Yeah. Hey, have My you wife your- was sitting right next to me, and now she's moved. I think she's disassociated and washed her hands of this conversation. H- have you read uh, your brother's book yet? I have. Yes, I have. I read a very early copy of it. He's not a bad little writer, I gotta say. I he kinda, can write fiction like a bad boy. I'm kind of curious. I kind of want to see it now. It's good. It's a it's a Christmas origin. Okay, so you know Krampus. Yeah. So it's like the opposite of Krampus. It's 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 the the Santa Claus, not the the people deserve, but the one that they need. So it's like it's like the origin story of Chris Kringle, Krampus's arch enemy. So it's it's a little darker. But uh, yeah, that's that's what it is. Well, He's, is it is it is it time for us to actually get onto our topic? It is. Yes, my brother did write a book, by the way. So just so you know, it's it's uh, on Amazon. It's called Nolly's Wager, and Nolly is like one of the dark. It's Norse. It's like Norse mythology. He's one of the dark gods, and uh, it's a it's a Nordic Chris Kringle origin story. A little bit dark, kind of comic bookish, uh, kind of superheroish. And uh, my brother's kind of like the coolest and toughest nerd you'll ever meet. That's nice. It is. It is. So uh, let's see here. And I won't be late next week. Oh, wait. <laughs> what was that? And I won't <laughs> be late next week. That's so rad. I got, I I got me a nice little sound bite. And I won't be late next week. <laughs> That's rad. I, you know, and, and I always know anything I say is going to be turned into a sound bite. <laughs> and I won't be I'm late for Chinese. Week. Oh, you want Chinese? Yeah. Yes. That's all I'm saying. All hey, right, Doc. You know what she's saying there. Kick she's us saying, off, Doc. Great she's Scott, saying be on time. It's time for this week's topic. Let's, Let's get, get down, down to the nitty gritty. Well, hey, guys. Um, today, uh, we do have a special guest. Um, she's specialer to me than she is to Pete. She is my wife. I married her 22 years ago. And uh, she only regretted it, in fairness, the first 21 years. So uh, c- get your butt over here. Come on over. Which I mean, is, will you please come sit by me? What, I love what Jamie hates, Jamie hates it when I go, we've had seven good years of marriage. We've been married for 18, but we've had seven <laughs> good ones. So uh, I will introduce her, um, and then I'll let her introduce herself um, cause you know, I'm not very good at introducing people, particularly my wife, um, Andrea, Andrea, no matter how many times I say your name, I could say it a million more times. Andrea is my wife. She and I met in high school. We have ministered together everything that I have ever talked about that I do. Andrea was right there with me, probably the genius behind most of it. And as Ginger Rogers said about Fred Astaire, remember everything he did, I did backwards and in high heels. So uh, my wife was raised by a family that was flooded by the Jesus movement. Keith Green was a big impact on her life, um, was actually a friend of the family in and out of the house, uh, pretty much uh, peppers their family photos. And uh, she and I got to know each other in senior English class. And she was dropping Spurgeon and Lloyd-Jones quotes and reading all the giants and, uh, you know, when I heard she knew Keith Green, I was like, wow, you know, I, I got to know you. So that's what happened. So uh, welcome to the show. Thank you, Peyton Jones and Pete Mitchell, the great. Yeah, you have to actually use the microphone. That's how it works here. Oh, I was Come close why to me. I was pushing my head over here. <laughs> <laughs> I'm always trying to get him no, off camera. I'm here with you guys. I feel like I'm kind of back in junior high, walking down the hall, and the junior high boys are there, and I just want to go the other direction. Mm-hmm. And um, so, 
Can you guys change for like maybe 30 We're minutes? We're going to get serious. This is the second half of oh, the show the where half. we actually get holy and serious. Oh, no, okay. no, that's him. I'm always <laughs> looking for something are that we, I can bring up. Are we done with the outhouse and revelation talking? I can't. I make no promises. <laughs> Okay, well, so, hey, let me introduce the topic. The topic is a connection from uh, the week before last, wasn't it, where we were talking about calling. And I said, man, it would be great to get my wife on here and to talk about how God calls you as a couple because I, I get the sense that a lot of guys think this is how it goes. I get called to things. My wife is my helpmeet. Therefore, she... Uh, eventually either submits to me and does what I think God wants us to do, or she's in total disobedience. And I think the younger you are, the more you believe that. And then the older and wiser you become, you realize, um, particularly as God does lead you um, together as a couple, that you realize you're not God's special right-hand man and your wife is your loyal assistant. You realize, no, he's calling us as a couple. We're a team. Back in the garden, Adam and Eve, were a team and you know okay granted they were they, they were a misfired dysfunctioning team but so are you and so is any team today but here's the deal god intended that man not be alone and that's not just so he can help you do your big boy man ministry stuff it's because god is calling you as a couple and so if he calls you as a couple and by the way when when i was younger i did i wanted to be spurgeon and lloyd jones and Who's really heard much about their wives, right? You hear more about uh, Spurgeon's wife a little bit. But everything we talk about is so male-centric. And when it got down to it, when it came to my calling, um, it wasn't my calling. It was very much our calling. And so, um, in fact, many times Andrea saw things way before I did. Um, she saw that I was going to be hired by Nam. Now, Andrew sometimes has a gift of prophecy, so sometimes that comes into play. But other times it's just been she, God was speaking to her even more so than he was speaking to me. Um, and there were times if she had not said things, I would have taken a completely wrong turn. And over the years, I can remember trying to force her into things and her kind of kicking back and saying, well, I don't want to do that, you know. And I, I had been taught and conditioned to believe Andrea should just want to do what I would and say, you know, Sarah called Abraham Lord and you're my Lord. No, that was a sign of respect. That wasn't that wasn't saying I am her Lord. You know, Jesus is her Lord and Savior and he will call her and talk to her. So anyways, we'll we'll talk a little bit more about that. But um, anyways, babe, I'm gonna let you talk now, which yes, is yes, kind of Lord. Yes. Yes. My my loyal Andrea um, speak. I kind of feel bad for her because I know how much or how little you let me talk. I'm kind of wondering if it's going to be the same way. I was her. just thinking that. I think I'll let you talk more than Pete. Well, I think I can just stop now. I mean, that's good. <laughs> well, that's the intro. That's just setting it up. So, Andrea, um, I guess, and Pete, you jump in when you have questions for, for Andrea. And, and Pete, thanks for joining our podcast today and being <laughs> a, a part of this. <laughs> so so here's the deal. I'll, I'll start off. You know, one, one of the things that um, – I, I guess really it, it just makes more sense for me not really to answer anything but to ask you things, like what it felt like. So um, tell them a little bit about when we met and how you had your calling and you were kind of like, hey, I've got my calling. And he, <laughs> you weren't like, hey, whatever God calls you to do, um, I'll follow. No, you had your calling. Talk, talk a little bit about that and then how that kind of became a, an issue with us and how, again, you knew best on that. Well, I think about um, back when I, I spoke to a, a group of um, women, women church planters. And um, I don't think you can really be called as a couple if you're not both secure in your own calling. Um, you're both got a calling from the Lord. You both have walked your own walk with the Lord up to the point before you become a couple. And you both are going to continue to have to have your own individual walk with the Lord as a couple. And out of that individual walk and out of that individual calling, you will just bless each other in your calling together than as a couple. But I think the problem comes sometimes is um, sometimes maybe a woman doesn't feel a calling 
before um, she gets in the ministry with her husband. And, and that's okay, but I think the Lord will still begin to work in her own heart, in her own life, yeah. the calling that he has on her specifically. Um, and it may not look like someone else. It may not look like me. And each woman has their own calling. Um, but for me, I was raised on um, a lot of women church leaders in the Bible, like uh, Elizabeth Prentice, Elizabeth Elliot, Amy Carmichael, um, these very prominent women leaders in the church and in church history. And I just, I just loved um, following and looking after those examples of women who just followed after the heart of God and the call of God. And then, you know, whatever came with their, in Elizabeth Elliot's case, she worked through three husbands, I think, um, and their callings came differently in each marriage she had. Um, but in our marriage, I think God took our individual callings and meld them together in what came our couple's calling. Yeah, t- talk a little bit about that. Let's let's kind of have a little story time here. Um, way back when I was on staff at Refuge uh, Huntington Beach, and I was the assistant pastor next in line to be the senior pastor, was the interim pastor. Um, and you and I had some very serious talks back then about calling because— You had been to the mission field. I had been to the mission field. And both of us, you know, not short-term, short-term. I mean, you were there nine weeks, and I think I was over in Wales for six weeks. And, you know, we were seriously weighing our calling. And God planted a seed in my heart, but I had no idea I was going back to Wales. And at that time, we had a conversation about calling. Do you want to kind of unpack that a bit where I told you, hey, I, I can't guarantee that, I'm going to be a missionary um, because at that point you were very strongly um, sure of your calling. Yeah, I knew I knew I was going to be on the mission field. And um, if I was going to be with you, then we would have to be on the mission field together. And I remember we talked to our, my pastor about that as well. And um, that was something that I really and you had to wrestle through and to see um, if God was going to be able to meld our callings, our individual callings together. And um, my calling was definitely not to stay in Southern California. Um, two things I never wanted, was that was to be a, um, a doctor's wife or a pastor's wife, because I felt like both got kind of left behind and, and didn't, really, um, didn't really get to, to do you know, our work with their, their spouse. And I wanted to be a team in whatever we did or, or if we went off to the mission field or whatever we did. And um, for me... When you and I both kind of said, well, no matter what we're going to do, it's going to be mission. I think that was the, the changing point for me and and that whatever we did, it was going to be a mission together. Well, the the amazing thing is, <clears throat> you know, I went I was called to go to Wales, um, undoubtedly, but I thought it was just to learn, you know, like I was going all these places where revival had broken out and I was on a spiritual quest to go deeper with the Holy Spirit. When I came back, something had been lit and awoken me that was part of mission. And I, I raised this point in reaching the unreached, ching, where what I say, wave your arms and the light will go back on. Oh, no, oh, you don't have the magic arms. So here, here's the deal is I, sorry, I have a time sensitive light in my office, only professionalism on this podcast. But what, what happened was, um, I was kind of like, yeah, you know, I'm going to go over to the mission field. I'm going to learn what I can and come back. And in reaching the unreached, teaching, I make the point that you don't really come fully awake as a Christian, I don't think, until you go on mission. And what I mean by that is you don't awaken to your purpose and calling until you start using your gifts. And those usually get awoke on mission. So when I came back, something was woke in me, but I still had my calling wrong. I now say, in hindsight, that God loved me way too much to give me the calling I thought I had, which was to be the next Lloyd-Jones or Spurgeon. And, you know, I I had a preaching gift. I really did have a preaching gift. And and it it opened many, many doors for me at a very young age. And yet God was like, look, the world doesn't need another good talker, you know. And, And so when we talked, I was like, yeah, I want, you know, I'm going to be a preacher, Jonesy. You know, I didn't call her Jonesy back then. I don't remember what I called you, Andrea, mm-hmm. Lake Yamada. So, <laughs> so what mm-hmm. happened was, um, 
when we had that talk, Andrew is like, look, um, I, I'm called to mission and I, I think I'm called to you because you also had a, an experience where you felt God calling you to me. And so for Andrew, that had to be kind of frustrating because you, did you tell her, Thailand. did you tell huh? her, by the way, that was God calling you to me? <laughs> oh, I remind her all the time. Remember, God told you, you to right marry here. me. <laughs> you know, the, the thing is, is she was she had she knew when she was in the mission field that she needed to be with me. But the 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 faith and obedience, I think, that came through with Andrea was that I wasn't there yet. I didn't know I needed to be on the mission field. And I think that was a huge step of faith for you that you were like, I. Well, it wasn't quite like that. <laughs> okay. You tell it your was, story. It was, I mean, I think when I was on the mission field, I was in Thailand and, um, you were going to take the perspectives class yeah. and it was a real struggle oh, for yeah, me. Yeah. Um, I was ready to break up with you. Yeah. I was so, going to break up with you because your pastor, you'll be quiet and, right, um, <laughs> you talk. silent. She can out talk. Men me. must be silent in the church. Um, <laughs> finally, we can't get him to shut up. This is awesome. <laughs> it, so we, we interrupt each other all the time. It's what we do. Yeah, he told me not to talk over you. I am one of seven, so I do talk over people, which is why I'm with Peyton, because I can talk over him. But where was I? So I was out on the mission field in Thailand, and it was really important to me. I'd, I'd left. I felt called to Thailand and um, just to work there. You were back home, and you were going to take perspectives class, and that was like a prerequisite for my husband. Had to take perspectives class. And Tell them what perspectives is. Perspectives is perspectives on world missions, and at the time, it was the best missions class out there. It still is. Um, it still is, and it it basically taught you about going out overseas, not to go with a culturally attached Jesus, how to really reach people where they're at. Um, basically everything you put in reaching the unreached. No. Um, so, so the most hardcore missionaries on the planet, guys like Don Richardson, Peace Child. They all come on this He's thing. shaking his head because you're interrupting. Because you can't stop talking. <laughs> you can't stop talking. Yeah, I can't. Let her tell her story. Yeah, see, now I have to start all over again. So, perspectives. Stop. So, Ser seriously. <laughs> Let her talk. He, he was um, he was supposed to be taking this perspectives on world missions class, and I was super excited on what he was going to learn, and, and just that perhaps this would be the melding of our visions, and he already was a great teacher. I loved the, his Bible teaching, but I really wanted to see how our lives were going to come together for mission. Because um, for me, I didn't see a role for me, especially as a young woman during that time. I didn't see a role for me within the church. I saw my role outside of the church, more of the parachurch um, mission field kind of um, role. And so I really wanted to do something missional. And... Um, I remember he was so good. He would write me a letter every other day for two months. I got um, letters out in, in Thailand. And except it came in Thai mail, so I'd usually get about 12 letters all at once. And I remember going through the letters. It was all great. And at one point, halfway through my trip, I was there for a few months, um, I called him on the phone. He goes, oh, did you get my letter? And I said, what, what was the letter? He goes, it was the one I um, told you I couldn't take perspectives on world mission. And somehow that letter of all the letters had gotten lost because um, I think had I, I gotten that letter before I talked to him, I don't think there would have been a Peyton Andrea Jones because I was really, really upset that um, he wasn't able to take the perspectives class. And it was more it wasn't his choice. His pastor didn't want to give him up during that time for him, didn't want to release him um, for that time to take perspectives. But at that point, I really went back home and thought, gosh, if he's connected with this pastor who really doesn't have a heart for missions at that time. Um, and we are supposed to be connected together. How is this going to work? And um, at that point, I felt God say, whatever you do, you two are going to do on mission together. Don't worry. And um, it was a clear thing. So it was, it was that it was not as much that I was going called back to go be in that church, specific church with you. Um, that was another discussion we had to have about me. <laughs> Is the church that he had was at at that time, he it wasn't very missions focused. It was going through a lot of upheaval. The pastor um, ended up falling into sin, and, and actually everything changed. But um, it really was a call back to us being missional together. That that yeah. was what I felt the Lord said. Whatever you do, you're going to do together 
um, as a mission. And it, so therefore, my call and your call began to get melded at that time, I think, for the first time. So in, in that time, I did, I did do a really stupid thing. We were, we were getting married. We were engaged. And I was like, hey, look. And, and this, is, this is where I see guys a lot of times try to force their wives into what they want. So I was like, hey, look, I'm on staff. Now, I had gotten counsel from the pastor we were with. And he was threatened by Andrea because at that time he was in sin. He was doing drugs and, you know, he was basically using me. So in one sense, I was getting all this time in the pulpit because he couldn't pull it together. And he was getting threatened by Andrea because Andrea was starting to say, hey, what's what's wrong with your pastor? You guys haven't sent any missionaries out. Um, who is this guy? And uh, and at that time, he he would he was like, OK, I think she's on to me. He was telling me, hey, man, you better make her come here. And he was worried he was going to pull away. She was going to pull away. Um, really, the guy he was leaning on to kind of run the church. I started beginning. I, I started running the church while he was there towards the end. And um, and so at that point, um, I, I made an ultimatum, which started all kinds of trust issues with us. Where I said, look, if we're going to be together, you're going to have to come to the church I'm a pastor at. Like, it just doesn't, okay, I had a point, but the way I went around it with an ultimatum was the worst thing I think I've ever done. So we broke up. <laughs> yeah, we did. <laughs> yeah, so at that time we broke up. Well, that was, was that before? Or that was after I came back from Thailand, right? Yeah. Yeah, so you were going your, through your own thing. You thought I was going to run off to Thailand again, too. Yeah. Um, so we had our own little relational dynamics going on. But I think right there is a good example of how a woman has to be secure in her own calling between her and the Lord before she can even be a benefit as a team with her husband. And same with him. He needs to know his calling as well. And as you come together in the Lord, those will meld together. And and for us, you know, there was the youthful silliness going on. Um, but I think... For me, the ultimatum sent me back to my home church, which was very missional. But um, it's a good example, too, that I think God, when he brings a couple together, he's speaking to both of them at the same time. And you at that time were very blessed by starting to come to my church. And actually, that's where you met um, the Welsh preacher yeah. for the first time, which is the how we got our connection to Wales um, and going overseas on mission to Wales. And that would never have happened had you didn't leave your church part of the time and come over to my church a bit. Yeah, that's right. And and what was really cool is, you know, this guy was Lloyd Jones's protege. And he ended up taking Sandfields, which is a church we started at. Interestingly enough, Andrea's calling, you know, babe, your calling's really I would say that probably most of our church planners, their wives would not have from the time that they were children wanting to go off to the mission field. So it may be that people are listening going, well, my wife doesn't have that. Well, it's funny because my mentor, who God really used him to teach me a lot, his wife was, she was not called to the ministry aspect at all. In fact, her thing, and, and this is where it's a little bit deceiving, her thing was she knew her husband was a great preacher and she wanted to support him. And there's nothing wrong with that at all. That was what she felt. But her ministry was more of the ministry of a shepherdess. What she would do is go to their house. She would, whoever was suffering, my mentor was a sucky shepherd. He was a ter like it, it, he had no compassion. And if you complained about it, he'd be like, oh, suck it up, boy. You know, he, he came from the Pete Mitchell school. Suck it up, uh, Buttercup. Oh, you would have loved them. He was so old school in that way. He's like, well, you know, like no compassion. But his wife would go over to their house with whoever was suffering. She would sit with them, do their laundry, iron their clothes. Like she would do all their stuff. She's a key example. She embraced her calling of where she was at. And what that was really her. I used to watch her sometimes and envy how comfortable she was with exactly who God made her to be. And I was a young woman at the time. I remember going, "That's so amazing. She's just she's just comfortable. She doesn't have to teach. She doesn't have to do the things that perhaps other pastors' wives were called or other women leaders were called. She just served 
where she was comfortable. She was the best hostess with the mostess. She would give us the best tea cakes and, and tea. Mm. And she would. She would come over and, and find the need and serve. And So, you know, it's really interesting because when you speak to church planners, um, you know, and there's females there, you often will say, um, you'll talk about that, about, you know, the pressure of being a certain way as, you know, a female in ministry. Can you can you speak to that a little bit? Like you kind of hinted at it there, but um, can you talk about that, the different types of servants when, when you're a female, like God might use you one way or another. I think, I think women in general, I don't know how men are because I'm not a man, but we, we do tend to compare ourselves and we always want to be at all. He compares himself to me, <laughs> but that's about all I know about that. We always want to be at all. If, if we see, and especially if we see a woman we admire, Oh, I, that's, that's who I'd like to be at, but that might not be where we're gifted at. I had um, a young girl, well, actually, she's just a little bit younger than me, but um, she was in our, our ministry and she tended to be more of an introvert and I'm not an introvert. And she was trying to emulate me and look at me. And she said, I, I just, I don't think I'm going to be good in the ministry because I'm such an introvert. I'm this way. I'm that way. And yet I noticed in her things that I wished I had. She would have the ability to remember people's birthdays and send them cards when I would, I would not even think twice about it. And she had a way to just go and sit quietly in the corner with someone and talk to them and really get um, into a deep, heartfelt conversation with someone and get some time to pray with them. And her gifts were, again, different, but she was trying to emulate me. And rather than what God had gifted her in, and I think for us as women, sometimes we'll look at the different women around us. Um, I loved you know, my pastor's wife. And the way she was just an amazing Bible teacher, and I wanted to emulate that. And maybe we'll look at the women around us and think, oh, that's what I should be, or that's what I should be. And yet God has something completely different set up for us according to our gifts and spending that time alone with him and learning what those gifts are and finding the thing that really lights that fire in us. Like, oh, I really feel comfortable when I do this with people Mm -hmm. Um, or even feel uncomfortable, but I still like it when I do this ministry. So you and I, we have slightly different giftings. Um, So I would, I would say in many ways, you're, you have been all your life a lot more radical than I was in the sense of what you want to do and where you want to go. But I, I would say that I had more of the apostolic makeup with a bent towards teaching and evangelism. Whereas you had an apostolic makeup with more of an emphasis on shepherding and prophetic. And so if you guys know in Church Zero, cha-ching, I talk about a Swiss Army knife when you're apostolic. Andrew's apostolic, but her big blade would be, you know, like I said, shepherding and prophetic. So when we would be called to leave here, you would have kind of the shepherding, and I would be like, hey, we got to go here now. And that was always really hard for you. Um, and I think that as we have left different place and gone to different place, um, there have been times where you have really tempered me, and the key example would be when we got to the States, um, and you were like, hey, can we stay put now? Because you were always gung-ho to go wherever and do whatever, but there's definitely a sense in which I think God's used your shepherding to say, let's put some roots down now. And you can do a lot more sometimes when you put roots down. Um, can you speak sometimes to, because I could pick up any of our transitions from Sandfields to Lampeter, from Lampeter to Pillar, from Pillar to Long Beach, from Long Beach to where we are now, not all of them have been pleasant. Some have been right. Some at the time, you know, it was a little confusion. Um, we definitely, it's not like it's all been easy. I mean, do you want to speak into that at all? Well, I think... For me, when we're when we're church planting, when we're on a mission, my heart is for discipleship. So for me, a successful church plant is never about the numbers. Um, I, I wouldn't even think of a, a church plant failing if it had five members that were um, being discipled. I think it's a successful church plant. That's just kind of how I'm wired. So for me, I would like to see. I like to see that people are okay. I like to see that their marriages are changing, that their lives are changing, that they're growing deeper and their walk with the Lord. And then I feel satisfaction um, in that. And if we move too much, 
Then I worry about those we left behind, our babies. And I suppose Paul the Apostle was a bit like that too, where he'd write the letters back and he'd want to know, are they okay? Are you guys okay? What's going on? Who's shepherding you? Who's helping you to grow? Who's helping you through these um, trials that you're facing now? Um, and I think for us, the learning curve as we moved from church, as as life kind of changed for us and as we left um, the different churches, um, it was circumstantial that we left on each situation. And we learned each time we handed off a church what to do and what not to do. Mm. And I think for me, handing off successfully is handing off and the church thriving and doing well not in numbers, but in people being discipled and growing. And I think for us, for me, the hard part was to see, um, you know, if we handed off a church and the people struggle. Yeah. And then that that would that's that that was the hardest part for me. They struggled. They were hurting. Um, they would find it very hard. And I was wasn't sure that that was the most successful way for us to minister. Um, as we hand it off. And then, you know, the second handoff, as we were church planting, we learned from. We began to disciple people as we were handing off and seeing people. Um, when we left, it wasn't as big of a deal to the people. And that was a lot easier. And I think now, looking into the, the way forward, it's a different season in our life, too. We have kids, or back then we didn't. And our kids also need to be able to connect with other Christian kids their own age and begin to grow and get discipled themselves. And so it's a different, I think each stage was a a different stage in our life. And I don't, I don't mind so much leaving as long as I know and have the satisfaction of knowing that the people are going to be okay. I know we're running out of time, but one of the things also uh, that really meant a lot to me, and I think the time where I really started to see you as my partner was after I got broken from my fancy plans, you know, my high and mighty dreams of being Lloyd Jones, which happened after the Lampeter experience when, you know, I always say I got kicked in the teeth, but really it was the Lord breaking me down and, and showing me, Hey, you might've been the golden boy in these other couple churches, but you're not the golden boy in the kingdom. And, you know, it's not about you and it's not about your preaching gift. And, and what, what happened was, uh, we were getting ready to do something in, you know, because this thing in Starbucks was really taken off. And I started opening up to the fact that maybe this is going to be a church plant. And Andrew and I were walking in a field. We did a lot of walking together and a lot of talking. And, um, and Andrea at that time, um, she looked at me and goes, I'm open to that. And I see the Lord at work, but I don't feel safe. Because we don't have a team. And I remember I was such a wreck spiritually at that point. Um, I was almost testing the limits of God's grace, you know, by my attitude. And, you know, I had felt deeply hurt by God. But I remember just feeling like right now Andrea is carrying us because I'm not, I'm not. Like I'm not, I'm in a bad place. And she's kind of carrying us right now. And, and, there is a time where one carries the other, but um, for me at that time, I remember looking at her like, I'm so glad you're here because I don't trust me at all, but I know that you're listening to God right now and I'm hearing God speak through you. And uh, and it was it was nice. And I, I think perhaps it was a long time coming, but I think for the first time in ministry, I, I not just, oh yeah, she and my partner were missionaries together, but I think that was the first time where I started to go, you really are uh, my partner in this. You're not Peyton's partner. It is that we are both called to be together, whatever that looks like, and to minister together. And that's a big change, I think. When you don't see your, your spouse as your partner to do your thing, but you see it as, no, like the important thing is that we are ministering together. That's the important thing. Not not what it is we're called to do, but maybe more the how, you know? Does that make sense? Yeah, and I think we <clears throat> we also began to learn, because we're both very <clears throat> strong, bullheaded people, yep. I suppose. Well, all, all missionaries and apostolic <laughs> people need to be, as one and of my mentors taught me. I think what we began to realize, too, is your calling and your view and the things God was putting on your heart and my view— 
when we would bring them together, we'd get God's view. Mm. And it was, and it's like that in everything. It's even in that, in what we, how we decorate our house or whatever aspect, how we raise our kids. It, it, it bleeds into every area of our marriage. But we began to realize that what God's speaking to you, what God's speaking to me, it's two pieces of the puzzle. And then we come together and it's actually, it builds the whole picture of what he's doing together. And it's better than what you could have done on your own or I could have done on my own when we come back together. You and Pete are making googly eyes at each other. He's what is going on? laughing because I picked my nose. <laughs> and I was just wishing I had the snapshot button closer. <laughs> he just rolled his eyes and shook his head like, you just picked your nose on the podcast while your wife's a guest. <laughs> yeah, I'm used to it, Pete. I'm used to it. <laughs> but our listeners aren't. I wanted to get a picture of it. Sound effects. <laughs> It'd be so much more precious if I'm standing right next to my wife. <laughs> I moved over. What were, you, what were you saying, babe, before you were so rudely interrupted by Pete? Yeah, it was good, but it's done now. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're out of time anyways. Pete, is there anything you want to ask or add? Calm down, Italy, diddly, 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 diddly. They did their best. Shoddily, Italy, Italy, diddly. Gotta be nice. Hostility, diddly, diddly, diddly. Oh, hell, did I think dog crap? <laughs> And that's Ned Flanders letting us know we went over time today. But this has been Peyton Jones and Pete Mitchell. Oh, 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 oh. oh. And all Andrea that time. Jones. Oh. Wait, wait. So I only want to know is when you're doing church plants, who does all the bookkeeping? Well, Pete, I'm so glad you asked that because you can't just dump it on your spouse, you know. She's a person or he's a person, too, with feelings. They're not just your little, you know, walking, talking calculator. You need to go to simplifychurch.com. Wait, and what check was that? Out, oh, 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 simplifychurch.com. Oh. They'll take care of all your bookkeeping needs, your IRS compliance, and even your staffing. They'll handle even payroll. I uh, like it. Go to simplifychurch.com and check them out then, silly boy. Okay. <laughs> all right. Well, this has been Peyton Jones and Pete Mitchell and Andrea Jones. Reminding you, if you want to reach ones nobody's reaching, you need to go where nobody's going and do I don't, I don't know I don't, what, what nobody's doing. My next book is going to be called I Wish I Listened to Pete. Thanks for joining us for another weekly episode of the Church Planner Podcast with Pete Mitchell and Peyton Jones. We'd love to hear your comments on this episode of the Church Planner Podcast. Visit us online and let us know what you thought at churchplannerpodcast.com. If you subscribe to us via iTunes and have enjoyed the podcast, leave us a positive review. The more positive reviews we receive in iTunes, the more iTunes will promote us to other church planners who would benefit from this show. This podcast is brought to you by the Church Planner Magazine, which is available in the iTunes newsstand or online via churchplannermagazine.com. Music.